Hey everyone, this is Jaxi, and it is War Game Wednesday. Today we are going to play Ultimate General Gettysburg. This is one of my favorite Civil War games. It might not be the most accurate, but it is a lot of fun. I feel like it just has a great gameplay experience. We're going to do the balanced AI, and we're going to start at day one. Balance might not be the most challenged, but it is challenging enough, and I think that... You know, you don't want every game to be Dark Souls, basically. I make that joke a lot, but just want to do this normally. So right here we have Buford. We are set up on McPherson's Ridge, and it is day one of Gettysburg. So the 3rd Confederate Corps has bumped into Union Cavalry that they thought were militia. Now, why the Confederates were in the north? Um, a lot of traditional histories talk about how Lee wanted to invade the north to try to draw out the Union army. And then if they were able to beat the Union Army in the Union territory, then it would kind of freak out Abraham Lincoln and freak out the constituents, and he would be forced to settle for some sort of peace. I've actually been reading recently in Edward Ayer's The Thin Light of Freedom that logistics might have played a big part, too, that we forget how much food and fodder and supplies it takes to have an army. And the fact is, by 1863... You know, a lot of the fighting in the Eastern Theater had been done in Virginia, and Virginian farms and the Confederate supply system and logistics structures were really, really weakening. And a lot of Confederate soldiers and citizens and even higher-ups wanted to kind of take the fight to the Union. And that, you know, for Gettysburg and for even the marching in the days leading up to it and the end of June... Confederate armies and even Union armies then are forced to forage and draw on northern supplies. And so here, we are playing the Union. The Union is really good at standing in lines and having ordered fire and having effective cannons. And you can see what the Confederates are good at. They usually in the game have bigger brigades. And they want to charge and get in. And Third Corps right here is going all in on my skirmishers and all in on my center. And Devon skirmishers are retreating. They're fighting like 3,000 plus dudes. But luckily, I have some other units. I have Gamble's men firing on their sides. I have the uh, cavalry units harassing the Confederate cannons in the north and harassing the Confederates in the south. And I don't have a ton of dudes, but I do have this nice little cauldron here, and I'm going to be able to fire on them on many sides. That's the thing with the balanced AI. It wants to do attacks like that and wants to be aggressive, but eventually it's going to have to realize that I have them bottled up and this wasn't the best idea, even though they looked like they were going to break me as soon as I was able to get around on their flanks. Now they have some thinking to do, and you can see Archer and Davis, their brigades, they want to fan out. And I really like this game because you can see that you're really just drawing lines on the map that all of the brigades are attached, or uh, detached, excuse me, regiments, they're kind of just really clear. They have their nice icons for which side they are. The number of men are labeled. Even if they're not represented on the screen one-to-one, -one, you have all the information you need. Up in the top left corner, you have morale. How well do the men feel? Condition, it's kind of the integrity of the unit. How are they doing? How um, well can they fight? You know, units can't actually even charge if their condition's too low. It shows their level of cover and with... The Civil War weapons, I mean, you have the mini ball, you have rifled muskets becoming a little more popular, they have percussion caps, you're starting to get deadlier weapons, and so cover is going to be a big thing, and it does show reloading. Most units will try to do volley fire in this game. It looks like rolling fire, but they try to go about the same time. And right now, Devon's skirmishers are just getting chewed up, but what they're doing is delaying Davis. And I have First Corps coming in slowly. It does represent pretty well, like, which units were present on day one of Gettysburg and when they came in and from where. So the time scale is a little bit sped up. It's definitely not one-to-one. -one. You're not going to be playing for the entire morning and early afternoon. So... I have the Iron Brigade coming in, I have Cutler's Brigade, and I have a bunch of cannons, which is good because I am the Union, and Union loves cannons. But 
Yeah, just a great game. Um, I think artillery might be a little too deadly, and muskets sometimes don't feel like they are, but it plays out like a lot of these battles. You don't just have units break instantly. They fight, they might retreat, recover a little, come back. So one of the skills you have to get good at to be good at this game is kind of cycling your units based on condition and pull units off the line, let them rest, make sure your officers are up there. Like right now, Archer is pushing in, but I have Buford, I have um, Caliph's Cannons, and even though Gamble's Skirmishers are two pretty small units and they're split, they're going to be able to hold. And I'm getting the Iron Brigade set up on some trees right there so they have good cover. I'm trying to get Cutler up on Oak Ridge. And the objective for this part of day one where Harry Heath just kind of stumbled onto the Union and now both sides are scrambling to get reinforcements. You're trying to hold this first line of hills. The Confederates actually do have way over uh, by uh, Harris Tavern. They do have an objective, but I'm not going to do that. Right now, Gamble's Videttes are actually doing a really good job just harassing the Confederate cannons and keeping them tied down. The Confederates are bringing in Pettigrew and Brockenbro, and Brockenbro's, they're... It's not a huge unit, but Pettigrew is. It's almost 2,600 men. So I really got to delay and be smart. I'm going to try to get rid of Heath's skirmishers here with my skirmishers and my cavalry so that I can focus on the enemy. And Davis is going to attack Cutler. Even though Davis has more men, he's in the open. Cutler's not. And I have three units of artillery with a fourth one coming up. So... Should be good. Right there, I'm MLG clicking on everything. Uh, if you double-click a core, you will select all the units under it, and they will all try to move as one, but I really don't like doing that. I feel like it doesn't give me enough control for finer movements. One thing about this game that probably makes it the least realistic aspect of it, you have perfect information and even though there's a slight delay in orders really you are just this like omniscient god commander and you're able to do things with way more fidelity than a real commander could do you know there's not a lot of smoke on the battlefield like you see the cool effects for the muskets and the cannon firing but it's not like vision is obscured you're not sending couriers um you know the scourge of war si system like Gettysburg Scourge of War and the games in that series are much more accurate than that, but this one's a little easier to just pick up and play. That's why this one is a favorite of mine. And Davis right now, he's getting hit on multiple sides. This is exactly what I want because these big Confederate units, they are good at charging, and that's that charge in the beginning that just shredded uh, Devon Skirmishers down to almost nothing. You don't want that. The game gives the Confederates higher morale and a really good charge. But you want to try to get them in these duels where you can hit them on multiple sides with your smaller and more spread out units and not let them charge with their bigger and higher morale and higher close combat units. So we're doing really well in the north. Gamble now, because um, it's split in half, half of his skirmishers are getting hit on the flank. But the rest of Gamble's skirmishers are at least keeping the Iron Brigade's flank clear. And if I can blast Davis out of here, I can either hold this or kind of make it convex. And I got this little concave U here forming, because I was trying to hit Davis on multiple sides. I can get rid of that. The Bucktail Brigade, I think I'm going to leave them in reserve. I really don't want to commit absolutely everything because if a unit does start breaking or the condition drops, you want to have something you can rotate in so you're not just leaving the way open and letting your flank get turned and the like. And third core, yeah, they're spreading out. So Archer and Pettigrew and Brock and Rural, they're going to try to make a coherent line. I'm going to keep the Bucktails back and Biddle's Brigade... I'm going to have them right up with Stuart. You can get friendly fire in this game, but the way the units are represented, because they're not one-to-one, -one, it's pretty generous as long as you're not sending cannons straight into a flank or something. If you have units intermixing, they will try not to shoot each other and get in each other's way, 
it will reduce the effectiveness of their shots and there will sometimes be friendly fire but I find that oftentimes you have units mixing and it's not a huge deal. And if you see here in the center, the south is just bunched up. They are regrouping around their core. If you are close to the leader, that's when you will recover uh, morale and condition and whatnot faster. So that's what they're trying to do. The Confederates have a ton of artillery up on this hill. And I'm trying to harass them with Gamble's Vedettes over in the southwest, but... It is what it is. I think Biddle is just going to stay on this hill. He has more men than Brockenborough. And if he can take the cannons, then he's just going to tie down so many units and they will be the sacrifice. I'm not too worried about them. Pettigrew and Archer look like they're realizing that their best chance at victory points is to try to wheel around the north. But we're about halfway through. It's almost 11 a.m. on July 1st. And I think this scenario only goes to noon, and then you move into the afternoon and then the evening scenario for day one. Which is really interesting, the way Ultimate General Gettysburg does it. You have these linked, like, mini scenarios. So based on how well you do in the morning, you get to choose a couple of different outcomes in the afternoon. And based on how you do with that, you choose your evening battle. And... I think, like, especially as the South, you have a chance to, you know, make the attacks on the end of the Union line and not let them settle into the fish hook and not let them set up. Because that was one of the big failures of the South in Gettysburg was not following up on attacks and letting the Union establish the fish hook and really, really just hunker on in. And then on day two, as we all know, little round top. And then day three, of course, Pickett's Charge in the center. So Pettigrew is just getting nailed by artillery. And that is beautiful to see. Heath's skirmishers are being a pain. But the cool thing is they're too far to the north. I do have to just kind of let Baxter sit on that victory point because I don't want to lose it. But I am fine with the Confederates wasting four brigades on Baxter by himself. Because Davis has had a rough day already. He's lost a lot of men. And Brockenborough, he is not getting the better of Biddle, even though Biddle is taking all of the Confederate artillery fire. Yeah, Gamble's Vedettes, they, they bless them, they're trying. But it's not going to work out. It's just so fun. Like, I'm able to pan back and forth, just doing a lot of clicks. And kind of realistically, this is one thing I like. You do get lulls in the battle here and this waxing and waning where units will kind of pull off, reposition, come back, try a different way. You know, the South let themselves kind of get boxed in and hit on multiple sides. So now they've pulled off, they're rearranging, and Pettigrew's realizing, oh, I outnumber Baxter greatly, even with Stevens' artillery and Reynolds' artillery and a bunch of my artillery. They're hoping they can get the better of Baxter one-on-one. -on -one. And Baxter's in decent cover, but on McPherson's Ridge, like, they do have a hill advantage. And Archer is going to try to flank around. And Lane is going to try to... I don't know what Lane's doing. Perrin looks like he's spreading out to go attack my center. And Lane is going to do that. Really, because I'm on the defensive, I can afford to be this passive. Like, if you're are playing this game and you're the south you really can't you can't just sit back like i'm doing here and waiting for the confederates to attack and then responding appropriately you have to be a lot more proactive but as long as i can hold these victory points you know the confederates taking the time to deploy actually does work for me and so now pedigree is just taking flank fire with artillery and I love watching those counters go down whenever there's artillery barrages or uh, real nice musket volleys. It's one of the fun things about the game. I might eventually, for Wargame Wednesdays, play Ultimate General Civil War. But I like the battles in that game, but the actual campaign, you just have like so much Confederate bloat to the point where they have more men than the Union. And I get that it's trying to make a dynamic and challenging experience, but one of the things that balances these scenarios are the Union does not fight as well, especially in close combat, but they usually outnumber the South, and that's very historical that 
the South was always outnumbered, and that's one of the reasons that Robert E. Lee is so lionized and so mythologized in American history is you have battles like Chancellorsville where he was able to accomplish with aggression and daring what you know most generals couldn't do for lack of numbers. And right now, speaking of lack of numbers, Baxter is getting hit by two big brigades, but he is on a hill, he is in the woods, I'm not too worried. And now, since I've seen Davis and Brockenboro go south, I don't think the Confederates have much in the center. So I'm going to send Cutler and the Iron Brigade up to the north and try to get a flank on them. And you'll notice I'm still holding the Bucktail Brigade in reserve. More aggressive players might think that's wasteful, but if the Iron Brigade gets flanked and gets turned by something I don't see and don't know is there, then I can put the Bucktail Brigade in as a gap. And so always just have a reserve in this game, no matter what you're doing. Even if you're like the Union during Pickett's Charge, I've played that scenario on both sides and I might show it off on a War Game Wednesday. And you can actually have the Confederates reach the wall and get to the high mark, or the high water mark. And Armistead will push through, and you usually need something to throw in there and come back. Yeah, Perrin right now is going to bully Devon's skirmishers. Devon's skirmishers have gotten so beat up, they've lost like five or 600 men. But they are wasting a lot of time and taking some heat off Baxter, which is good because Baxter is not going to win a two-on-one, and he's certainly not going to win a three-on-one. But if you notice, with Cutler and Paul and Stevens, Lane right now is super flanked, and he's getting hit on multiple sides. I'm letting the Iron Brigade get real close, and then I'm going to stop him and just have him pour fire into Lane. And you can see as, yep, Lane is broken. The icons, another cool thing, is they will start to wash out, and the colors get lighter as they are thinking about breaking. And then it will straight up turn white and flash like Gamble's skirmishers are doing when they break. I was hoping Gamble's skirmishers could actually keep Davis on the run and mess with Confederate artillery, but the way I've kind of played out this scenario, any delaying action wins. And it's 11.49, now 11.50. It's 10 more game minutes, and then we win. And casualties should be on my side. Like, right there, Pettigrew's getting hit from two sides. And Paul and Cutler are about to have a say. They're close to breaking. Perrin, if I had the AI a little higher, maybe Perrin would try to flank. But even then, Baxter could just turn. I have so many units, and they let themselves get caught in that cauldron. And they didn't have a reserve. Like, there should be some unit they didn't commit that could then push into my center and force the Bucktail Brigade to do something useful. But they're letting me have my reserve. This is... A really good day one. I'm choosing not to take the last Confederate point because A, it's not super realistic, and B, the game will punish you for hubris. Like, you can do a scenario where if you take that point, you can attack the Confederates and try to brush them from the field, but they will bring up reinforcements faster than you, and then you will quickly see that it was not a good idea and you should just use it to establish a nice defense. But everything is going well. Baxter's only lost like 40 men since he's been fighting those two giant brigades. We have scales now, and I don't know if I've seen a lot of scales. I think they probably should have put their reserve into the center and to try to break me there, especially because I am starting to overcommit. Like, if the scenario went longer, you know, I probably could just take their final point, but... There's this lovely flashing icon up at the top that the battle's going to end in like a minute and ten seconds. So things are working out for the Union. But yeah, this is a lot of fun. I know I haven't done a lot of war game uploads in a while. But, oh, major victory. Beautiful. So for two and a half hours of fighting, just so many casualties. And you can see, except for, like, Devin, Gamble barely had more kills than losses. It was like 50%, 2 to 1 KD, but... Yeah, we had a lot of units with really good kill-death ratios. But yeah, I am going to start doing Wargame Wednesdays every Wednesday and get back to it. 
So look forward to that. And there's still going to be the history uploads. I'm going to balance both. And I look forward to playing more games. This is going to be an every Wednesday thing. Um, I already have a backlog building up. And so I'm excited to get back into the war gaming. I know a lot of you guys are subbed for that. And that's what you're hoping for. So now you got it. And stay tuned for that. Stay tuned for more history content. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you for hitting 150 subs. It feels awesome. And stay excited about history.